Hey there, Possum Rob here, starting a new thing. We're going to look at Star Trek, the original series, episode by episode, and we're starting with the second pilot, the one that actually aired. An episode that asks, what would happen if your best friend from college suddenly became a god? And yeah, it goes exactly how you'd figure. So strap in, because we're talking about where no man has gone before. Hey! So we're taking these in production order, mainly because, especially in this first season, it makes way more sense when it comes to the evolution of the look of the show, the cast, all that stuff. Also, I'd rather watch in the order the creators intended rather than the order some suit decided they should be in. Really, screw that guy. A little backstory on this episode because it's kind of special. This was the second pilot commissioned by NBC, the cage being the first one. They liked the first one, but thought it was going to be over the heads of the American audience. Too cerebral, they said. Flattering, right? So they wanted a second one that was a little less lofty. But this one was made as its own thing, not part of a series yet. So that's why it's going to look a lot different than the Trek we know and love. We'll talk more about that in the next episode, which is the first one after the show went to series. And we'll talk about the cage, that first pilot, when we do the menagerie because most of that is basically the cage anyway. So without further ado, let's get started with the plot. In our first voyage with Captain Kirk and the Enterprise, we get a signal from a ship recorder from the SS Valiant, a ship lost 200 years ago. A weirdly yelly Spock. Tapes are burned out, trying the memory banks. Ties into the recorder and determines that the Valiant encountered a strange space storm that beat up the ship a bit and also killed seven of the crew. But turns out one of them recovered. Suddenly there were a lot of Google searches on ESP, that's extrasensory perception, and probably somebody ordered them Time Life books, but that six to eight weeks for delivery turned out to be too long because something made the captain blow up his own ship. A fact that freaks even Spock out. Kirk decides to go wherever the Valiant went to try to figure out what happened. A course that would lead them out of the galaxy. And when they get to the galaxy's edge, there's this weird pink energy barrier that seems to be a surprise to everybody. They figure this must be the weird storm the Valiant encountered, but instead of hanging out and studying it, slinging a few probes in there and whatnot, Kirk decides to cram the whole ship in there and roll the dice. Well, go figure, same thing happens. Nine people die... Way to go, Captain High Score. And Kirk's old buddy Gary Mitchell, as well as psychiatrist Elizabeth Dana, get zapped. Dana seems to be okay, but Gary is out cold. And when he comes to, he's got silver eyeballs. Well, the storm burn out the ship's engines, and they're dead in space. And Mitchell is steadily getting creepier with how he's acting. He's able to read half the ship's library in a day and is able to diagnose one of the ship's mechanical problems just by reading Lieutenant Lee Kelso's mind. Kirk calls a meeting to talk about the increasingly alarming X-Man in the sickbay and Dr. Dana, who has become fascinated with Mitchell, defends him. No one's been hurt, have they? Don't you understand? A mutated superior man could also be a wonderful thing. The, the forerunner of a, a new and better kind of human being. Yeah, we're going to unpack that one later. After the meeting, Spock tells Kirk that there's a lithium cracking station on nearby Delta Vega, which might have some stuff that'll let him fix the ship, and also wouldn't be a bad place to leave old disco balls over there and make a break for it. That or just whack him now. Kirk says that's heartless. Spock says, that's Vulcans, baby. Long story short, they make it to the place, they find the gear, they fix the ship. That ain't the important part. Since he ain't a friggin' Nexus being just yet, they managed to drug Mitchell and put him down in the brig that the automated lithium cracking station has for, presumably, exactly this kind of thing. These lithium cracking station designers, they think ahead, you know? Very smart. Before the crew takes off leaving God Jr. behind, 
Kirk has Kelso rig up a self-destruct button that'll blow up the whole valley in case Mitchell puts up a fight and it looks like he's going to win. Well, Mitchell reads that whole plan, and the first thing he does when he makes his move is strangle Kelso with a power cable or something. Then he knocks everybody out, turns off the Briggs force field, and brings Dr. Dana in so that she can look in the mirror and see that she's sporting the silver marbles now too. She didn't get zapped as hard, so it took a little longer for her eyeballs to become fully disco fresh. Chief Medical Officer Mark Piper revives Kirk, tells him that Kelso got murdered, and that Mitchell and Dana headed off to get her someplace. Kirk tells him not to revive Spock until he's gone because all of this is his fault and he needs to handle it himself. Very admirable. So Kirk grabs Spock's phaser rifle and goes sneaking up on the Wonder Twins while Mitchell is busy pulling a tranquil paradise out of thin air. They sense Kirk sneaking up on him, and Mitchell sends Dana to go talk to him. He appeals to what's left of her humanity and professional training to see that what Mitchell is doing is gonna end up in a catastrophe of biblical proportions. She seems unconvinced, but when Mitchell shows up and makes Kirk pray to him, she starts to come around. Mitchell uh, mind digs a grave, and as a final insult to his former friend, Mitchell misspells Kirk's name on a tombstone. And before he can whack our dear captain, Dana does a heel face turn and starts brain zapping Mitchell. Well, Mitchell starts brain zapping Dana right back. All this brain zapping drains the both of them, and Kirk seizes the opportunity for some good old Kirk style debate. This ends in Mitchell being whacked in the head with a giant rock and being buried in the grave intended for Kirk. The brain fight with Mitchell turned out to be fatal for Dana, and she dies too. Muddy and bloody, Kirk calls for the Enterprise, and they all get out of jobs while they're waiting to see if this show goes to series. Great stuff. A lot of great stuff in this episode. We're establishing some distinctive voices for some of these characters. Scotty is there being Scotty from day one, and you love to see it. And while Sulu doesn't get a lot to do in this episode, George Takei wasn't going to just shrink into the background. He took every opportunity to stand out and be noticed, and it clearly paid off. Look at that. Well done, my friend. Spock's cold logic seems almost brutal at first, but he's proven to be absolutely correct. And he has a great line to hammer home just who he is as a character. Dr. Dana feels he isn't that dangerous. What makes you right and a trained psychiatrist wrong? Because she feels. I don't. All I know is logic. And the natural yin to his yang in the form of Captain Kirk is established in the very first scene. And like I alluded to before, Dana's line that a mutated superior man could also be a wonderful thing not only visibly brings a chill to every other character in that conference room, it would retroactively be particularly poignant considering the eugenics wars. Now, the eugenics wars hadn't been established in the Star Trek canon at this point, but one thing only 20 years in the past for the cast and crew at the time this episode was made was World War II, and the pain and devastation that kind of thinking brings was still a very fresh memory. And giving Dana that line was a great hint that despite still having normal eyeballs, she was already becoming like Mitchell. And I want you to look at Shatner's face when he sees that Dana has the mirror ball eyes. Yes, it just took a little longer for it to happen to me. It's a really subtle bit of acting. His expression falls just a little bit, but that perfectly displays Kirk losing a little bit of hope when he sees that she's starting down the same road as Mitchell. People forget, William Shatner is a classically trained actor, and he's pretty darn good when he wants to be. And hey, that same scene gives us our very first Kirk speech. You were a psychiatrist once. You know the ugly, savage things we all keep buried that none of us dare expose, but he'll dare. Who's to stop him? He doesn't need to care. Be a psychiatrist for one minute longer. What do you see happening to him? What's your prognosis, doctor? Another great line that's delivered perfectly is when Mitchell creates that oasis for Dana. Behold. Behold. 
It's just one word, but Gary Lockwood's delivery is really excellent and makes it a chilling indication that Mitchell has left his humanity behind for good. And finally, I want to talk about some of the visual effects. Something that might escape most people's notice is this really cleverly done turbo lift sequence. It's one shot, and they do it with a removable piece of wall, but it's really effective. And it looks like we really started the shot on one deck of the Enterprise, rode on a turbo lift, and ended it on a completely different deck. I love that. And while it's been touched up in the remastered version, both this version and the old version of the lithium cracking station matte painting looks fantastic. They end up reusing it for a couple of things later in the series, and for good reason. Albert Whitlock did all the matte paintings for Star Trek, and every one of them is amazing. And finally, I really like the briefing room set in this episode. This is the last time we see it this way, and I think that's a shame. I really dig it. The Goof Now there's some goof in this episode, too. First of all, Kirk beat Spock in 3D chess? I'm going to call bullshit on that one. Especially with Spock one move from mate? Some other game like poker or Pachisi or Trivial Pursuit or something where chance plays a role? Maybe. Chess is Spock's game, and there's no way that happened. And it's funny to me that when the department heads are called to the bridge, they spend a lot of time standing in this really awkward group photo pose in the back there. Dana even walks over to Kirk, says a line or two, and then walks right back to join the group photo again. It's like the director didn't want actors making their own decisions, but he also didn't think that what was going on in the background was important enough to actually spend any time blocking. God bless them, they're doing what they can back there, but it's just a weird and uncomfortably squished together configuration of people, and I can't see that without laughing. Now, we're going to be dealing with a lot of 60s tropes and conventions and all that stuff in this series, so it's to be expected to an extent. But Gary Mitchell spending the whole trip through the energy barrier holding Yeoman Smith's hand so that he's got to do his stuff one-handed was goofy. She didn't even ask for it. He just reached back there and grabbed her hand, almost like he's the one needing reassurance. And finally, as good as Gary Lockwood and Sally Kellerman are in their roles, the god fight they have at the climax is really kind of awkward. It looks like neither actor really knows what to do. Look at this. awkward, right? Not sure what to do with their hands, not sure if they should be registering pain or any kind of emotion at all on their faces, and just kind of stiffly sink into the ground. Maybe it's to make the VFX easier to apply, maybe that's just how people fight when they turn into gods, I don't know. It just looks weird is all. Ruminations. As mentioned, and as most of you already know, this is a pilot. Not the pilot, a pilot, because there were two. Because of the nature of pilots like this, you're going to get some changes between the pilot and the rest of the series. But even with that in mind, this has a much more pronounced case of pilotitis than I think any other show I've ever seen. Production wrapped on this episode, and it was almost a year before the next episode started filming. And a lot of junk changed in that time. We'll get more into that in the next episode, though. This is a heavy story to start this show with. This almost plays more like an episode of Twilight Zone than Star Trek. To be sure, Star Trek tackles the whole inner demons of the average human thing a few more times after this, but this one is probably the heaviest of the bunch. And this episode is probably the one with the least amount of humor in the whole series. It's very serious in its tone, and aside from the very beginning, there's not a lot of levity to relieve the tension and let us breathe a little. You really get an appreciation for what Dr. McCoy brings to the series here, because his absence is keenly felt in this episode. His mixture of joviality and righteous indignance could have been used to great effect here. It would have been interesting for later in Star Trek storytelling, like post-Next Generation, 
for us to find out that the weird galactic barrier had been a thing by the Q continuum to keep humanity in its own galaxy or something. Or maybe some kind of test, and when they try to get through it, their curiosity overriding their fear, they zap a couple people with Q-like powers and see how they do. Most of what Gary does is very like what we see Q doing later. I know there's been some references to this kind of thing in various books and whatnot, but it would have been nice for them to make it official. It also would have given us an explanation for the big pink circle around the galaxy that apparently you can't go over or under for some reason. Also, at the end of Star Trek The Motion Picture, Kirk says that he wants Decca and Ilea listed as missing in their Starfleet records. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it's an interesting parallel to how, at the end of this episode, Kirk wants Mitchell and Dana to be listed as having given their lives in the performance of their duty. I can see that being an aspect of Kirk's personality, wanting to make sure his crew is remembered positively, even if the circumstances were less than wonderful. He's a good guy like that, and I hope that was an intentional callback. So, there you have it. The inaugural Star Trek episode and the inaugural Star Trek original series review right here on Watching Stuff. What are your thoughts on this episode of Star Trek? Is this something you wish they would have kept from this version into the series that they ended up taking out? Any characters you wish stuck around? Let me know down there in the comments. I want to hear about it. So this has been Watching Stuff with Possum Rob. Come back later and we're going to watch more stuff you're going to love it. We got a long road ahead of us, so stick around. It's going to be a blast. If you liked the episode, sneak down there with your phaser rifle and like that thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, you don't want to miss all the great stuff coming out, so hit that subscribe button and join the Possum Friends. Because you know what? Possum Friends are awesome friends. Take it easy, alright? Later.